Today on Not Sam Wrestling, oh, has it gotten juicier between Dominic Mysterio and Liv Morgan, the latest drama in the Bloodline saga, the newest clues from Uncle Howdy, and what is going on between Bobby Lashley and Carmelo Hayes? This is Not Sam Wrestling. Welcome to Not Sam Wrestling, only one week away from the 500th weekly episode of this podcast. What an accomplishment. We'll get to it when it ti- when it's time to get to it because, quite frankly, there's far too much to get to this week to harp on our own accomplishments here at Not Sam Wrestling. Uh, and there's so much to get to, but where we'll start again, I think, is the bloodline and what we got in a, in a short... We got a promo segment and the first singles match from Tama Tonga since coming into the WWE uh, right after WrestleMania. We got Tama Tonga and Angelo Dawkins of the Street Profits in a, in a King of the Ring qualifier on SmackDown, which we'll get to, uh, but I think the the key takeaways from SmackDown, as far as the bloodline goes, um, is that Solo Sokoa, as he says, he says, has spoken to Roman Reigns. Um, I'll tell you why this was a well-played segment. First of all, Paul Heyman this late in his career, showing the range. It's one thing to be able to do one thing well. And by the way, that's not a shot on anybody. If there is one thing that you can do and you do it better than anybody else and you do it throughout your entire career, I call you a smart man. If you know this is the thing that I do the best, I'm just gonna always do this and you always do it the best, we got no qualms, me and you. You have figured out the game. But Paul Heyman, after so many years in the industry, going from, you know, manager to owner to commentator to writer to advocate to wise man, and now showing that dramatic range of really for the first time in an extended capacity being trapped, not being in control, but being in absolute pure survival mode and realizing that the bloodline has gotten away from him. What happens when you create or are at least partly responsible for the creation of arguably the most dominant faction in the history of the industry and then that control slips away from you? What happens? Well, we're finding out now with Paul Heyman because the headline is that Solo Sokoa says that he has spoken to Roman Reigns. We saw the the confrontation between Solo and Paul Heyman, and Solo is holding Paul Heyman responsible for his actions. This was what I liked. I enjoy in this era of WWE, I feel like more so than any other era, that there is a respect given to the viewer in the sense that you feel as though watching closely matters. If you watch closely, you get rewarded. If you pay attention to what's happening, you get rewarded. In professional wrestling, maybe more so than any other medium in the entertainment or sports industries, there have been lots of times in history where stuff just doesn't matter. Like you, like as closely as you can possibly watch, you will just have stuff completely washed away and go, yeah, but we're not doing that anymore. Now we're doing this. And we're just gonna pretend this never happened We're going to pretend this never existed. So until you guys all come to terms with that, you're going to have to deal with the fact that you're watching a show that doesn't reflect what you've been watching. So it becomes easier for us as viewers psychologically to just go, all right, well, if I want to keep enjoying the show, I guess that thing that I thought I was invested in never happened. That is why everything counts became rule number three at the end of last year. And living in an era where everything actually does count is so rewarding as a fan. Throughout history, there have been so many instances of us, the viewers, knowing that something was happening before the superstars that were being affected by these things were aware of it. And there were times where you wanted to grab your TV and shake it and go, why don't you just watch the show? I understand that you're on the show, so you can't watch it live, but it's the modern era. The clips are on YouTube. 
The clips are on Twitter. You can watch it on Hulu. You can watch it on Peacock. You can DVR it and watch it when you get home. But if you would just watch the show, you would understand where things are going. You would understand that you're in danger. I knew you were in danger. How did you not know that you were in danger? And when we saw Solo Sokoa talking to Paul Heyman, finally, and maybe this is the genius of Solo Sokoa as a villain, it might be the first villain that actually watches the show that he's on because he's aware of all this stuff. You know, we follow these beats. We study them. We see on the SmackDown before Backlash, Paul Heyman goes, I haven't spoken to Roman Reigns since WrestleMania. Oh. And he realizes he's made a huge mistake. And Nick Aldis turns around and goes, what? And Paul Heyman goes, oh, no. And a rare mistake is made by that character. Because you realize not only has he said it, but all over his face it reads, he didn't want you to know that. And that's when he's forced to admit that Roman Reigns is not the person who voluntarily took himself out of the draft. It was Paul Heyman that decided to take Roman Reigns out of the draft after Roman Reigns wouldn't return his calls. So there was, instead of it being like it was in the past where Solo Sokoa, since he wasn't on the screen, on the exact screen when it was happening, would have been like, oh, I had no idea you did that. That was a private conversation between you and Nick Aldis because I wasn't on the screen. So I didn't know that happened. You know what Solo Sokoa did? At some point in the last seven days, he went back and watched SmackDown before Backlash. And he was like, oh, I saw that segment. So now when he sees Paul Heyman, he goes, you haven't spoken to my cousin since WrestleMania, right? Which is my favorite thing that this new Solo Sokoa does. Solo Sokoa went from not talking, by the way. He spent a year and a half never talking to the point that that was the bit. Like The Rock saying that Solo Sokoa is going to sing the national anthem. Solo not laughing when Sami Zayn said Usi. The whole bit was Solo doesn't talk. Now... Not only is Solo talking, he's the only one in the bloodline talking, and he's flanked by two Tongans who don't say a word in between them. It's remarkable. But Solo, my favorite thing that talking Solo, this version of Solo does, is when he goes, right? Because you go, oh, I mean, he's correct, but I don't think I want to agree with him. I think he's leading me down a road. I can't disagree with him. I can't go, no, Solo, you're wrong. Because number one, he's right. And number two, if I tell him he's wrong, he might rip my head off. However, I feel like I'm walking down a road of affirmation that I am not going to want to stay on. But he watched the show. He watches the product. Solo Sokoa, I think, is a listener to Not Sam Wrestling because he realizes that I don't need to speculate wildly. I can just follow rule number one, watch the product. And no, rule number three, everything counts and act accordingly. Because that Solo Sokoa is living his life as a character on SmackDown by the rules of Not Sam Wrestling. And it's awesome. He goes, I saw it. I was watching SmackDown. You told Nick Aldis you hadn't spoken to Roman Reigns. And then he goes, and then you saw my brother Jay. And you gave him a look, a look he, he referenced the look of pleading. You know, we all watched Backlash and we saw when Paul Heyman saw Jey Uso for the first time in a very long time because Paul Heyman doesn't hang out on Raw all that often. Maybe a couple episodes on the road to WrestleMania, but certainly not since WrestleMania. But we saw Paul look at Jay and with his eyes, it was almost like he was telling him, help, please do something. I, I've lost control. I need your help. Except here's the thing. Sometime between Saturday and Friday, Solo Sokoa used his six days to actually turn on Peacock and watch Backlash. He had he had won his match with Randy Orton and Kevin Owens because Tonga Loa showed up. So he goes, let me rewatch that match. We won. I'll celebrate myself a little bit. 
And in the meantime, let's see what else happened on the show. I think it could be very, very valuable information. And as it turned out, it was. Because he goes, and then you looked at my brother Jay, right? He knew because he watches the product. And you go, oh no, I don't remember the last time we had a villain this dangerous, a villain so dangerous because he actually watches the product, right? I mean, it's so, and then he pulls Heyman in for that hug. He goes, it's okay, Paul, I love you. Oh, when a, when a bad guy, when a dangerous guy, there's something about that. When you're scared of somebody for the physical harm that they could do to you, and they hold you close <laughs> and they they tell you that they love you. Not that it's ever happened to me, but it's the last thing I would want to happen to me. I would far prefer that guy to be like, you're in trouble. I'm going to beat you into oblivion right now. That to me would be more comfortable than him holding me closely and telling me that he loves me. There's something, there's a threat that is so looming about that. And it's the same hug that he gave to his brother, Jimmy Uso. You're my brother. I love you. And then, boom, caved his head in with the help of Tama Tonga and a steel chair. So now, he goes, you haven't spoken to my cousin Roman, right? And Paul goes, right. And Solo's mad. He goes, so you took Roman Reigns out of the bloodline for the draft, and that backfired. You were the reason that we got drafted in third in the third round. You know what that does to my money? Okay, see, now we're not just talking about egos. We're talking about real stuff. If this is an ego play, it's like fine, but I'm not invested. Now we're talking about money. We're talking about the idea that the people get drafted first are the ones that are looked at to be in the high-profile situations, the big payday situations. And that's what this is about. The bloodline has always been about providing. The reason that Roman Reigns was in the position that he was in was not just on a bigger scale. It was because he felt, of course, that all the WWE superstars, all especially on the SmackDown superstars, should have a certain amount of reverence for him because he was the one that was drawing the house. He was the one that was making the product hot. He was the one making all of them richer, yes. But in terms of being the tribal chief, of the Anawai Fatu Mayavia Samoan family. That was because he is the one bringing in the money. He is the one putting the food in his family's mouth. He is the one that is so successful, he is allowing his cousins, creating opportunities for them by getting them work in the WWE. Now Solo is apparently doing the same thing, creating opportunity for the Tongan branch of the bloodline. So he says that Paul Heyman is disrupting that by making it so that they're drafted in third in the third round, which is not putting them in that position to make the most money. So he's asking Paul Heyman, are you trying to take food out of my family's mouth, out of my children's mouth? Is that what you're trying to do? No, 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 no. And that's when the hug comes in. He says, you haven't spoken to Roman, right? Right? He goes, no. Solo goes, I have. And Paul Heyman has this look of absolute terror on his face. I have. And he tells him, well, Roman has said that I'm in charge while he is gone, which means that you're my wise man now. You were Roman's wise man before. While he's gone, you're my wise man because I'm in charge by orders of the tribal chief. Which makes me believe that we're gonna keep hearing that by orders of the tribal chief. Now the question is, is Solo flat out lying? Has he not spoken to Roman Reigns at all? And he's just telling Paul now that he knows, right? Because he didn't tell Paul he had spoken to Roman until he knew that Paul hadn't spoken to Roman. So is he flat out lying and creating a scenario where as long as Roman's not there, he's not gonna get called out on it? Is 
Solo telling the truth that he has spoken to Roman, but we're going to watch him go so rogue that Roman's going to come back and be like, what are you doing? You're not leading this the way we talked about. You're not leading this the way I would have talked done it. You're leading this for yourself. And if either of those two scenarios are true, why hasn't Roman Reigns called Paul Heyman? Why wouldn't Roman call him to tell him if Solo, if he did call Solo and say, you're in charge, why wouldn't he have also called Paul to say, hey, just so you know, I'm putting Solo in charge while I'm gone. And if that's not the case, why isn't he calling Paul to be like, hey, dude, I did not talk to that guy. I'm sorry I didn't return your calls, but I did not talk to Solo. I mean, you could say maybe he doesn't know any of this is happening, but then apparently Solo watches the shows and Roman Reigns doesn't because I know it's happening. And I'm pretty sure Roman Reigns has Fox. So there's no reason why he wouldn't know. Either way, I'm fascinated to see where this is going to go. I have to believe, I mean, either one is possible, right? My initial, right? My initial idea was Roman Reigns going to come back and wreak havoc all over Solo because he's going to say you were lying, right? But I think it could be even better if when Roman does come back, Paul thinks that Roman is back to save the day. And he goes, Paul, my cousin told you that I talked to him, but I didn't talk to you. And Paul goes, yes, my tribal chief. That's what he said, my tribal chief. I'm so happy you're back, your tribal chief. And Roman goes, that's because I did. And everybody goes, oh. And Paul Heyman goes, but then Roman goes, but I had no idea what you were going to do while I was gone. And everybody goes, yeah. And that the story is that Roman did do this, did put Solo in the position of power, but is so dissatisfied with the way Solo has behaved while he's been gone that he feels like he has to do something. That, that the second option of Solo is telling the truth, but Roman's still not happy about what he's decided to do. Maybe even more interesting. I don't know. But I'll be watching as this goes on. I will tell you that Tama Tonga has an incredible entrance. So we see him in the King of the Ring, and we'll talk about the entire King of the Ring tournament and Queen of the Ring tournament later on on the show. But Tama Tonga's entrance stuck out to me. It was like there is, there is clearly no plan of not maintaining the bloodline as a main event group. Those fire cannons shooting out from the floor, those blasts of flames shooting to the ceiling as that Tongan music plays. You know, clearly they are high on, on Tama Tonga and what this is going to look like. Um, we'll see how far he advances in the King of the Ring tournament, but if that entrance tells us anything, we're in for a lot. Now we are going to talk about what we happened uh, uh, what we happened, what we saw is happening with Cody Rhodes and his next opponent. But before we do, let's unpack what is going on with Dominic Mysterio and Liv Morgan. I mean, this, this is getting big. A couple of weeks ago or last week or whenever it was, I came to you and I said, look, I see a scenario where in her quest to take everything away from Rhea Ripley, Liv Morgan goes after Dominic while Rhea Ripley is gone. And there was that moment a week ago on, or two weeks ago at this point on Raw, when I forget who was even doing a promo. Maybe Drew McIntyre was doing a promo? And you saw from behind him, Liv Morgan left a dressing room. And I thought at the time, that's odd. Wouldn't Liv have known there's a live promo happening why would she just be walking around backstage? And then as I'm thinking that 25 seconds later, Dominic Mysterio walks out of the same room and it's never brought up, but those of us on the internet that are watching closely, it's all we can talk about. Did you see what I saw? Nobody else saw it. Nobody on the show saw it, but I saw it. Which by the way, the fact that it's so subtle goes back to other people on the show. Like it's, if the judgment day didn't see that, that's okay. Right? I mean, even if they're watching the show, the fact that they missed that, you could miss that. But my God, the sleuths, they were at work. So this week on Raw, we start with the Judgment Day. 
And this is a crucial thing to start with, of course, because of of how the Judgment Day left backlash with with J.D. McDonough and Finn Balor both being out there after Damian Priest beat Jey Uso and uh, Damian Priest not being happy with either of them and Damian Priest not being happy that they were out there and scolding them before he celebrated his title win. Well, Damian Priest goes to the ring and he compliments uh, uh, the Judgment Day. He compliments himself and he apologizes. Damian Priest apologizes to the Judgment Day. And I kind of, we haven't really seen this as much with any other faction as we have with the Judgment Day. This thing where every time you think that they're beat, every time you think that they're done, every time something happens where you go, oh, okay, so they're breaking up the Judgment Day, something else happens that brings them back together and it's like, okay. And I think that that's a cool dynamic for this group, that at any point they could break up. But at the same time, there's never been a faction that's better at making up than the Judgment Day. There have been multiple instances where they're at each other's throat and then something happens and they go, all right, I'm sorry. All right, I messed up. It's very human of them, really. It's very like layers to the story, more so than things have been in the past. But usually what ends up happening is there's some kind of success. Somebody wins a title or something and they go, okay. You know, when when Damian Priest and Finn Balor were at each other's throats, it was like they won the tag team championship. And all of a sudden it's like, okay, I forgot. We're really good together, guys. Do I think we're still going to see the breakup happen? Yes, I do. I, I, I mean, I think at some point we've got to see a title match between Damian Priest and Finn Balor. I would think that Finn Balor is the baby baby face, but it almost feels like after what happened at Backlash, you could see JD and Damian, I mean, JD and Balor taking out Damian Priest and him being the baby face. But regardless, that's not where we're at because the Judgment Day is back as a unit. We don't know exactly, I mean, but we'll get into it, what my prediction is who Damian Priest's opponent is going to be next or who it's going to be at the King and Queen of the Ring premium live event, assuming that Priest is going to defend that title there. Uh, But what we do know is the Judgment Day is is together and they all all hug each other. They all have a wonderful time. And Dominic Mysterio is out there looking like a million bucks, looking like he's cooler than the other side of the pillow. Dominic with the most spectacular mullet in modern day WWE with one of the great trash stashes in the history of that underrated style of facial hair, wearing cowhide and a sling like no one has ever done before, and wearing a purple bandana around his neck. This has been a staple. It, sometimes he has it, sometimes he doesn't. But for, at this point, well over a year, I think beyond a year and a half at this point. Yeah, we're in May, over a year and a half since Dominic Mysterio was put in jail for 24 hours and it changed his life forever. This is something that he and mommy Rhea Ripley went through together. Well, Dom still rocks that bandana because he remembers what his time in the clink was like. And I didn't notice this until much later. But about an hour and a half after that, segment happens. Dominic introduces Carlito to the Judgment Day. Now, we've seen this play out before. Every time he thinks that somebody is around that wants to beat up his dad, Rey Mysterio, Dominic tries to get them in the Judgment Day, and it never works. We saw it with Andrade. Now we're seeing it with Carlito. Doesn't work. But that's not the point. That's not why I'm bringing this up. I didn't realize until some of the cyber sleuths helped put these pieces together But if you'll notice, an hour and a half into the show, or more, Dom wasn't wearing the bandana. He no longer had that purple kerchief around his neck when he introduced Carlito to uh, uh, the Judgment Day. I didn't notice it because who would? I mean, big deal. He took off the bandana. Maybe his neck got warm. You know, who's, who's to say? Who leaves a bandana on all day? Hogan? Other than that, Nobody. And then later in the evening, 
After that segment, Liv Morgan has an in-ring segment with Becky Lynch where she has the confrontation and then damage control comes out and then and then Liv Morgan takes a powder and does not make the save for Becky Lynch, like making it pretty clear that this version of Liv Morgan is indeed a villain. It was hard to notice. But if you go back and look, there appeared, it, it was extremely hard to notice, but there appeared to be something in Liv Morgan's shorts pocket. I didn't notice it until you go back and look at the photos that Liv took at Raw. Liv posted a, a, a photo that one of the WWE photographers took of her backstage at Raw and she's posing. She looks like a million bucks. She has a purple bandana in her pocket. Liv Morgan had Dominic's bandana in her pocket. Dominic is wearing a bandana around his neck. An hour and a half later, there is no bandana around his neck. And after that, that bandana that was once around the neck of Dominic is in the pocket of Liv Morgan. You really mean to tell me that one week they're leaving the same room 30 seconds apart. The next week, a purple bandana goes missing and shows up in Liv Morgan's pocket unless Liv Morgan is secretly doing prison Mike cosplay and we just never knew about it. This is pure scandal. And I am telling you, something's got to give. I believe that Liv Morgan is going to win the women's championship. And I believe that when Liv Morgan wins the WWE Women's World Championship, she will receive help from Dominic Mysterio. There will be an embrace. And we will see these two working together. I am telling you right now, mommy's got to understand. You got yourself a man like Dominic Mysterio. This dude is irresistible. If you're going to be out on the shelf... These, these women, they're going to come rocking. They're going to come knocking. They're going to want to do something with this stud, <laughs> Dominic Mysterio. And that's where Liv Morgan is at. Seriously, though, Liv Morgan is playing this game, okay? And I love it. And I, I, I love where it's all going because we're seeing these pieces get put together. And to me, it's clearly leading to a situation where Liv Morgan and Rhea Ripley finally settle the score. And once Rhea Ripley beats Liv Morgan, I think Dominic Mysterio gets kicked to the curb by both of them because he betrayed mommy and he's no longer useful to Liv Morgan. So what happens to Dominic Mysterio after that? I don't know, maybe Tiffy time. Maybe Dominic Mysterio ends up with Tiffany Stratton. I don't know. I don't want this Dominic Mysterio thing to end. Clearly, it has to go somewhere we can't raise it to the heights and heights and heights, but that's, that's why somehow this story is turning out better than it could have possibly turned out. Because when you were heading to WrestleMania, it was clear that Rhea Ripley was a baby face and about to be the biggest female baby face in the company. If that is the case, she can't be seconded by Dominic Mysterio. It's got a short shelf life because of the position that Rhea Ripley is in. So what are you going to do? Leading into WrestleMania? I don't know. How do you, because Dominic is like as hot a bad guy as you've got, not in the traditional sense, but just in the sense that everybody reacts to this guy. So if Rhea ditches him, Rhea's not going to have any problem staying hot. How do you keep Dominic hot? Well, right now, you end up putting him in this thing. You know, for a little while, Liv Morgan's going to be doing her thing over here with Becky Lynch. The Judgment Day is going to be doing their thing over here, trying to figure themselves out. Dominic Mysterio is going to be rocking that sling like nobody else, but eventually you get to this thing where they unite. Then after that, eventually Rhea Ripley comes back. Everything explodes. You've brought Dominic all the way up here now to where he's involved in this, in this white-hot, female rivalry and when he gets dumped by both of them because Liv Morgan let's be honest there's no way she's going to be able to stay a villain long term people love her too much that's when you got to go okay what's next for Dominic because that, there's no cooling off with Dominic where's he going next is the question 
And that's when you start looking at, do we want to do Tiffany Stratton? Do we, is there somebody we want to make a villain that we put them with Dominic and boom, we're off to the races. Do we want to go to, uh, uh, Katana, uh, 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 Kiana James. That's her name, right? Who just got drafted. Maybe one of the new women coming in. Maybe a Blair Davenport gets a little Dominic rub. Who knows? But I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be a good time. Speaking of good times, we get the main event. What I think is the main event announced for uh, King and Queen of the Ring in Saudi Arabia. Huge match. Cody Rhodes is in the ring with Nick Aldis. And boy, do I have some things to say about that. And he goes, I got your opponent and Logan Paul. Hey, yo, or whatever his music starts with comes out. Logan Paul comes out and we've got a champion versus champion match. And by the way, another enormous match in Saudi Arabia for Logan Paul. I think that he must be huge over there because when you look at the matches that this guy's had, Saudi Arabia is where Logan Paul had his match with Roman Reigns. Enormous match for Logan Paul. Saudi Arabia is where Logan Paul had his match with Rey Mysterio, where he won the United States Championship. Enormous match for Logan Paul. And now Saudi Arabia is where Logan Paul gets his second shot, by the way, at the WWE Undisputed Championship against Cody Rhodes, uh, only being Cody's second opponent. Uh, I like this, first and foremost, before we get into the logistics of it, I like this as the next opponent for Cody Rhodes. Uh, I feel like even more so than AJ Styles. Like AJ Styles is pretty clearly defined as a villain at this point now, where like this is the quote unquote heel version of AJ Styles, 100%. However, I do believe that, uh, that Logan Paul like exudes villain there is nobody confused like with AJ Styles ultimately you 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 accept that he's a villain you follow the story that the hero Cody Rhodes dressed in white is facing the villain AJ Styles dressed in black and also AJ Styles is just jacked now and it's way scarier when a villain is jacked than when he's not AJ Styles looks like Bane but AJ Styles is so respected so beloved his entire body of work is so celebrated and his match quality is so good that even when you're booing AJ Styles it's almost because it's an assignment not because you actually are invested in him getting his comeuppance Logan Paul it's it's another thing Logan Paul is a pure heel Logan Paul is an absolute villain you love to boo Logan Paul. You don't want that guy to win. And the idea that Logan Paul, of all people, whom some wrestling fans go, wow, I'm I'm still mad at him for ruining our ring mats. I like when my ring mat was nice and pure. Not a thing on it. No logos. And now there's that prime bottle on it, and I just can't stand it. There are some that say that. And they boo Logan Paul. Other people are like, oh, I watched all these YouTube videos. He seems like a bad guy. I'm going to boo Logan Paul. Other people just watch wrestling. And they go, there's something about that guy that I don't like. And they boo Logan Paul. Or they show up going, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give him a chance. And what does he do? He insults them. He insults the city they live in. He insults their favorite wrestler. And they boo Logan Paul. You show up. Because you want to boo Logan Paul. And you show up because you want to cheer Cody Rhodes. That is how you make a beautiful main event for a premium live event. I also love the idea of Cody Rhodes because it almost gets a little bit predictable, right? Cody Rhodes has become somebody who regularly has multiple match series with opponents. And we've seen this with other people, right? You know, Seth Rollins having multiple matches with Shinsuke, whatever. But you think of Cody, you go, okay, he had the three matches with Seth. He had the three matches with Brock. He had to, he ended up having multiple matches even with Roman Reigns. But the, even Shinsuke, he also had multiple matches with Shinsuke. And there comes a point where at times, that's a good thing. Right at times, it's like that. That's that. That makes sense, and I want to see more. But at other times, you go, well, 
If you need to do the same match at multiple premium live events, maybe just do less premium live events. With that said, I love the idea, even though like if you had told me we were just going to do another Cody AJ match, I don't, nobody's complaining about that. I believe David Meltzer even gave it five stars. That means everything. I think the idea of Cody having to go through a rogues gallery, I love the idea of until there's that next big sink your teeth into it story, which with Cody coming off of a two-year ultimately story with the bloodline and with Roman Reigns and finishing the story and the road to getting that championship, you can't just immediately go into another story because it's impossible to match the importance of a story that was career-defining. The entire career of Cody Rhodes built up to the WrestleMania 40 match. You can't just jump into another like, and now we're telling this story while we're waiting for that next story to really click in. And while we know that The Rock is at some point going to be knocking on the champion's door, I kind of like the idea of Cody having to take on a rogues gallery. I kind of like the idea of eventually it catching up to Cody Rhodes. I kind of like the idea of Cody going like, I'm going to do what Roman didn't do. I'm going to be at every premium live event defending this title. I'm going to be at every live event, every house show defending the title. And it makes it seem like more when he's got different opponents every single time. When it's like, okay, first it's AJ Styles. Then three weeks later, it's Logan Paul. Then three weeks after that, maybe it's Tama Tonga. Then three weeks after that, it's at some point it's going to be Gunther, right? You would hope so. And then a few weeks after that, it's this person. Then the money in the bank's in play. And, then, and he's got, you, you want it to feel like because Cody had to conquer the world to win that title. What you want it to build to is this feeling that Cody now has the world coming at him. And it will make it feel like an even more special thing that Roman Reigns did. For Cody's reign to be successful, you want Roman's reign with the title to be as important as possible. Because that means that Cody's reign is that much more important, right? So what you want to do is go, oh, this, like, have Cody at some point after going through AJ and going through Logan and going through LA Knight and going through all, like, at some point, be sitting there going, like, I thought I was ready for this. I had no idea. I'm doing media interviews, you know, every day. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. And I have another person every couple of weeks knocking on my door going, now it's my turn, now it's my turn, now it's my turn. Friends? People who were my friends, because once we get to that, right? I brought up LA Knight, but once you get to the LA Knights and the Kevin Owenses and all these people that want to be the top dog but were in the ring with Cody Rhodes, all these people that are friends with Cody Rhodes that are now knocking on the door going, hey, bro, we're still friends, we're still cool, but I'm here because I want to be the champion, not because I want to be your friend. And Cody's realizing like, oh, friends, enemies, none of it matters. They're all coming for me. And that is what I would love to see this be the beginning of. That the, the as soon as he conquers one opponent, Nick Aldis is here with another opponent. And Nick Aldis may have other motives. But I also want to know, what is this match all about? Is this a winner-take-all match? Is this the winner gets both titles? Because it wasn't said that way. Nobody on SmackDown said for both, it's title for title. Nobody on SmackDown said winner take all. But Cody specifically, all Nick Aldis said is this is who you'll be defending your title against. He didn't say Logan would be defending his title. Cody on SmackDown said, if I win the United States Championship, I'll be a Grand Slam champion when I am not a Grand Slam champion right now. He also then tweeted two belts and then later quote tweeted the advertisement for the match at King and Queen of the Ring and said, for all the gold. If this really is for all the gold, I don't see Cody winning both titles. I think if Cody also won the United States Championship, 
it would be overkill. Even if he's going to win the United States Championship and combine the titles and then make this the new winged eagle belt or something. I, If Cody wins a title and combines it with this one, it's going to really start feeling like, oh, Cody just gets everything. You know, I, I, I don't, I just don't see it happening. This is the title Cody wanted. The idea that two months after WrestleMania, he's now wanting another title is like, like this, you got your title. I also can't help but feel like if both titles are on the line, this is going to end in a schmoz and it might. You know, maybe this isn't about Logan Paul. Maybe they don't want Logan Paul to lose. And maybe it's title for title because somebody else is going to run in, be it a member of the bloodline, be it whoever. Somebody else is going to run in and and destroy Cody and have this thing end in a schmoz. I mean, I don't think Logan Paul is going to win the WWE Undisputed Championship from Cody Rhodes this quick after WrestleMania, but I think that is the story, the idea that this guy could hold WWE hostage and he could have that title. I mean, that's kind of the beauty of Logan Paul, that the idea of him winning the WWE Championship is absolutely feasible. Absolutely. So I don't know. I I, I would love some clarity, and I hope we get that clarity uh, on SmackDown. Um you know, I, I, I'm assuming either way it would be intentional, right? That there's the, that because it's just two different ways of telling a story. If it's a WWE championship match and Logan Paul is not defending his title, well, that's one story you're telling. If it's title for title, that's a different story you're telling in a different way to look at it. So we'll see. But when we talk about the way we look at it, we've got to talk about, uh, what happened with Nick Aldis. So Nick Aldis, I feel like is dropping breadcrumbs, okay? The same way I'm picking up on these breadcrumbs being dropped by Dominic Mysterio and Liv Morgan is the same way I'm picking up on these breadcrumbs being dropped by Nick Aldis, who first, he makes this announcement video for Twitter. Like a lot of times, both of them, Adam Pierce and Nick Aldis both make announcements on Twitter. This is what's gonna happen on SmackDown. But when he makes the announcement that I believe the announcement was that Cody Rhodes' next opponent was going to get announced or it was for King of the Ring or whatever it was, this is what's happening on SmackDown. Uh, in the background was a picture from All In and Cody Rhodes and Nick Aldis in the ring together competing for the NWA championship. That wasn't an accident. Whether that was something that was orchestrated by the powers that be, whether that was like a big picture thing, or whether that was just Nick Aldis kind of doing a little business, that was not an accident. That was reminding everybody, hey, I may wear a suit now, but don't forget, I've wrestled for a world title on pay-per-view against Cody Rhodes, and I'd like to do it again. Because then Nick Aldis comes out on SmackDown and he says, uh, I know this man, Cody, I know you well. And he says it in a way that there's a lot under it. You know what I'm talking about. He says, Cody, I know you well. He also, and I don't know, maybe this, this is just his British sensibilities. I don't know if this is just the way he wants this character to carry himself as a GM. But he didn't say, the WWE champion, Cody Rhodes. In almost this celebratory, yeah, we got him here on SmackDown. Cody Rhodes is our champ. Hell yeah, dude. The, 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 the bloodline has given me so many problems. Yes, Cody's here and he's the man. Instead, he said, WWE champion, Cody Rhodes. And I said, maybe I'm reading too much into it. Maybe he's just playing it cool. But with the all-in picture, with the way he introduced Cody, and with the way he said, I know you well. Cody, I know you well. I couldn't help but imagine what happens if in this rogues gallery we revisit Nick Aldis versus Cody Rhodes. Like, what if Cody Rhodes beats Logan Paul at King Queen of the Ring. And then what's the next show? Uh, uh, 
Clash of the Castle. Clash of the Castle is the next show. Nick Aldis may be a good opponent for Clash of the Castle. If you're going to do it, I didn't even realize Clash of the Castle is the next show. I mean, it's in Glasgow. Nick Aldis is not Scottish, but it is the UK. It, you know, there is a, a connection there. It's, you know, I mean, Drew McIntyre wasn't Welch, but it, there was still a connection there. It could be, I mean, I just, I just am, am looking forward to the moment when Nick Aldis is announcing Cody Rhodes' opponent. And he goes, Cody, your next opponent is me. And we go, what? Nick Aldis has been keeping himself in shape. When is it going to be time for Nick Aldis to take that suit off? When is it going to be time for Nick Aldis to say, I love being the general manager of SmackDown. But I want to know, and this, and it won't be a, a, a tyrant. It won't be a general manager gone crazy. I mean, it could be. I wouldn't be. I wouldn't mind it so much. But what if Nick Aldis just tells Cody, "No, it's time for me to test myself. I want to see if I still have it." So I'm, I'm uh, uh, temporarily because he's a great general manager. You don't want to lose him. I'm temporarily. I'm going to take a leave of absence. Before I announce your next opponent, Cody Rhodes, I'd like to announce that here on SmackDown, I'll be taking a temporary leave of absence as the general manager. Oh, wow, a temporary leave of absence. We love you, Nick. Where are you going? Well, it's not so important where I'm going. What's more important is the last act that I take as SmackDown general manager, at least for the short term. And the last action I take is to name your next opponent. Your next opponent's Nick Aldis. What? Ah! I kind of like that better than the idea of Nick Aldis losing his mind and, and attacking Cody and, and doing that. Nick Aldis saying, I am taking a temporary leave of absence, but my final act is, as manager before I step away temporarily is to make myself your next opponent. And then somebody else can come in and it could be a fun thing. It could even be Teddy Long for the next 30 or 60 days or something like that before Nick Aldis takes over again. But I'd like to see it. I'd like to see Nick Aldis have one more chance in the ring. I'd like to see him have one more chance against Cody Rhodes. And maybe we can build a story where we actually believe that this general manager ain't done yet. Maybe you get a general manager in that's really good and you go, well, I kind of like that general manager to stick around. Maybe Nick Aldis is going to win. Maybe there's a story to tell here. I don't know. It could be very, very interesting. What is very, very interesting is we've got the latest on Uncle Howdy. I'm scanning QR codes over here, guys. I am scanning the QR codes so I know what's going to happen. On Monday Night Raw, we got this QR code towards the beginning of the show, and a video pops up. And it's like an empty old, I think it's a library. It's like bookshelves. It almost looks like it's from like Chernobyl or something like that. Like it, it looks like, it was a site that was either uh, uh, on fire or bombed out or something like that. The books are still there. The shelves are still standing, but the, the ground appears to be like rubble and all the shelving in the books are all like kind of ashed out. And there are birds flying in the, in, in the background as text comes up that says, drink from his suffering. And then it says, and then this other text comes up that says, even now you doubt us, but soon you will understand that all we ever wanted was a chance. And, and, and when it says that all we ever wanted was a chance, there are underscores between each word. And that comes up as a code. You know, it almost looks like a, a, a computer coding. And then a night bird comes up and then some kind of symbol that we've been seeing. And then this was the most interesting part. You see like a jolt. Right. And it looks like there's somebody like you see a little like a leg or, or, or some kind of body go around the corner of this bookshelf. And then the body approaches the camera real quick and then it cuts off again. But boy, oh boy, does that body, the part of the body that we see, boy, oh boy, does that look like Uncle Howdy? It looks to me like a trench coat. It looks to me like a gloved hand. It looks to me like the black pants. It looked like Uncle Howdy in those bookshelves. Under the video you selected, it says years in the metonic cycle and a Blackbird logo. And I, I saw somewhere 
on one of these Twitter accounts or something like that, that the years work out to 19 days, 19 days being the amount of days between last Monday's episode of Raw and the King and Queen of the Ring premium live event. Another clue that we're going to see whatever this is at the King and Queen of the Ring premium live event. Derisive was the URL extension and as a little, uh, 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 little whatever, I don't know if this was intentional or not or just something that automatically happens on your phone. But when I lock my phone and that's the page that was up, you know how like uh, it'll the title of whatever video you're watching on your iPhone will show up in a thing on your lock screen? On the lock screen, it said derisive. And the source code, if you go into the source code, had a link to an article about Bo Dallas from like 2022 or something like that, 2023 maybe, uh, not being expected to be back on TV. Oh, 2023, it was from last October. So it was from October 2023, and it was just like a link to like a wrestling news site that said Bo Dallas not expected to be back on TV anytime soon. So this really feels like, you know, then there's a code, right? The, 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 this thing comes uh, under under that text. There's a button to push. When you hit the button, it's it's the bird. It's the blackbird. And when you click on the blackbird, this this puzzle comes up. And you and you there's numbers and letters, and you and you crack the code. And when you crack the code, the puzzle says, "You know nothing. Hell is only a word. Reality is much worse." Now that quote is from the film Event Horizon. And it's from the ending of that film. And in the ending, I I think the significance is that the character that is being told that to, like a a, a guy is saying that to in this battle, and the character who is informed, you know nothing, hell is only a word, reality is much worse. That character who's being told that to is damned to hell in order to save his crew. So could that mean that Uncle Howdy, the Wyatt Six, whoever the Nightbird stuff is referring to, does that mean that they were damned to hell to save the WWE? Does that mean that from the ashes of the fallen Bray Wyatt, they are here to to fulfill his destiny, right? The way, like, if that character perished and had to and 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 could no longer live so that his crew could fulfill their destiny, are they there? Is that why they're there? I don't know. But to me, the two videos we saw that it's really getting interesting and it's really pointing towards this is happening quickly probably King and Queen of the Ring, because then there's another QR code, and it's on SmackDown. And where on Monday the QR code was derisive, and I didn't write this down when I did it, but I'm going to read you the definition. I should have written it down in my notes, in my bullet points. But uh, the definition of derisive is mocking or jeering, expressing, serving for, or characterized by derision, expressing or characterized derision, mocking, ridiculing. So maybe they're saying they were mocked, they were ridiculed. Maybe this is going back to kind of what the building blocks of the Bray Wyatt Fiend character are. That if you go through what all the puppets symbolize, they all symbolize things that Bray Wyatt was mocked for, right? Huskus the pig boy, he was mocked for being heavy. Husky Harris. Uh, 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 Ramblin' Rabbit is when Bray Wyatt was mocked for his promos that didn't mean anything, weren't going anywhere. It was just him rambling. Uh, 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 Mercy the Buzzard could be when Bray was mocked because he was copying Waylon Mercy. Even though he spoke to Dan Spivey, he was inspired by the character that that he went in a different direction. There were some that still mocked him for going like, this is a, a Waylon Mercy ripoff. Sister Abigail, remember how bad that got? Remember that Survivor Series where where, thank God it didn't happen? But we were about to get the pumpkin fiend. I mean, I'm sorry, the pumpkin demon, Finn Balor with orange paint versus potentially Sister Abigail, which appeared to just be Bray Wyatt in a wedding veil. We didn't get it, but it was mocked mercilessly. And then who am I? 
speaking of mercilessly, uh, uh, no, I did mercy the buzzard. Uh, uh, I feel like I'm missing one of them, but you get what I'm saying. That maybe the reason derisive is 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 saying that mock that they were all mocked, and so now they're coming back in an, in this new form, fueled by all that mocking. Because then the QR code on SmackDown, which instead of it being derisive, was R R M B R R M B H P A W, which some genius, this was not me, uh, uh, figured out could be Ramblin' Rabbit, Mercy Buzzard, Huskus Pig, Abby Witch. And that works out so perfectly. That has to be right. Somebody on Twitter figured that out, not me. Want to give them credit. Um, of course, all the Funhouse characters. So what was really interesting was at first, and it was this, I love this stuff. The video that if you follow the QR code on SmackDown, the video starts with the then now forever package. And uh, it's a lot of the people who reposted the video cut off the then now forever package, right? They thought that the significance of it was that uh, at the end of then now forever, it stutters on forever and then it glitches on together. It goes forever forever. Together, 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 right? And so some of the, like the video reposts of this that I saw on Twitter, like it cut it off there. So you kind of got the context of the together stuttering, but not the other stuff. But if you look at it before, when it goes then, now, and I think right around now, Randy Orton's face comes up on the thing. And if you look at what this version was, you have to look really closely, but a veiled figure is next to Randy Orton. There's a veiled figure next to Randy Orton that is not, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it, that is not in the real then now forever together open. That veiled figure is not there, but the veiled figure was there in this one. And the veiled figure was next to Randy Orton. What was the end of The Fiend? It was Randy Orton. When Randy Orton beat The Fiend because Alexa Bliss turned on The Fiend. And that was the end of The Fiend. Forever. So I think that, that, that what you've got is the, is, is the veiled figure we've come to know and love. I think that, that, that we associate that with Sister Abigail. But, but to me, I go, well, that's a Sister Abigail version of what could be the history of Alexa Bliss being next to Randy Orton saying, we're not done with any of you. Everybody that was a part of the past of this journey that Bray has been on is a part of this story. And that's why Sister Abigail is haunting Randy Orton in this open. Maybe I'm looking too much into it, but that's what I got from it. Now, I don't know if that Sister Abigail is Alexa Bliss if you read on the internet, some people think it could be Nikki Cross. I don't know. I lean towards Alexa Bliss, but I have no idea. So that's just the first, you know, whatever, minute of the video. Once we get into it, the glitches start. And that WWE logo is flashing. And it, and it comes back and forth throughout the whole video. And forever, together, 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 forever, together. That's going, repeating, and stuff like that. And on top of the WWE logo, text comes up. And it looks like... Uh, uh, the font looks like the text that you would put, like if you ever had like a, a, a high eight camcorder growing up and you could make your own titles on the camcorder so that it would go on whatever you were videoing, this is the font that it looks like. And it says, uh, they put us in a cave. They told us to behold the glory. Then it says, we watched in awe, consumed their lies, then over the WWE logo going in and out, it says, we were never the chosen ones. Left in the cave to rot, to be forgotten. But he set us free. Now we understand. We follow the prophecy, the word of the red. Soon you will understand. The tears we shed watered our antipathy, our antipathy, 
antipathy and blossomed a garden of revulsion. There is no safe space. Only my family. And then it ends the intro again. So I'm sitting here going through this like, like I mean, this is, this is great stuff. This is the stuff that I love, right? So we were never the chosen ones. They left us in a cave to rot, right? To be forgotten. But he set us free. So these are people who, these are the, the, the students of Bray. These are the people who maybe they felt like the WWE made promises to. These are people who we, we, we were going to be stars. We were going to be superstars. You know, we, uh, they, we, we, behold, we beheld the glory of the WWE, watched in awe, consumed their lies. They told us, you're going to be the next superstars. And then found out they weren't the chosen ones. They were left in a cave to rot and to be forgotten, but he set us free. So whether that's people that Bray had with him, whether that's whatever, I mean, I think that that you can say that's Alexa Bliss, who it was like she was getting kind of aimless, and then Bray found her and gave her a new life. You could talk about Eric Rowan. You could talk about uh, uh, a number of people. Theoretically, you could talk about Braun Strowman if you want to with that. Obviously, Bo Dallas. Bo Dallas is a guy who got released, who got brought back because of his brother. Bo Dallas was the NXT champion. He was never put in that position on the main roster. We follow the prophecy, the word of the red. So the word of the red to me is the most interesting quote here because there are two things that I think of. The first thing that I thought of is the quote that Bray Wyatt said himself, which is, in a world of black and white, I am the color red. It's a famous quote. It was redone in the doc. I think it was, it was just a big part of his life. I feel like the word of the red is referring to Bray's word. You know, these are all the pupils of Bray Wyatt. Now, there is the off chance that the word of the red is referring to Eric the Red, who is Eric Rowan. That's possible. He's got that big red beard. That's very possible. But ultimately, which would imply that he's potentially the leader, which is, again, plausible, possible. I think more than likely this is an Uncle Howdy-led group, but ultimately it's really led by the word of Bray Wyatt, the prophecy of Bray Wyatt, and the word of the red is in direct reference to in a world of black and white, I am red. Soon you will understand the tears we shed uh, watered our antipathy. I'm going to, I mean, and I know, I know what antipathy is, but in case you don't, you know, I did great on my SATs, but in case you don't, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll tell you the exact definition of it. It's a great word. That's what I thought. Extreme dislike, aversion, repugnance, repug. Um, there's no safe space. Go, oh yeah, the garden of revulsion. I thought it was revolution the first time I saw it, but it was revulsion. I'm revolted by it. And then there is no safe space. Which is interesting because safe space is, of course, I mean, it's a big buzzword right now. Could mean nothing. It also could be in reference to Joe Gacy. Joe Gacy's whole character on NXT 2.0 was about safe spaces. You know, when you see there is no safe space, you go, oh, could this be a Joe Gacy-led group? And then only my family... This is going to be something that brings it all together. So, I mean, a lot going on in both the SmackDown and the Raw videos. I would imagine that this week we'll get even more going through those QR codes. It is, I mean, it's my favorite. It's my favorite thing. What can I tell you? I love it. And I'm going to have my eyes glued. I mean, it's got to be King and Queen of the Ring, right? The 19 days, the the... The stuff, I, I don't know. I think that, that we'll get more specific references to King Queen of the Ring in the QR codes that we see this week. And when we do, I'm sure that we'll talk about it. Let's talk about the King of the Ring. Now, um, this is, uh, I don't want to go on all day. I know you guys got things to do. Uh, but there's a real interesting thing going on with Bobby Lashley and Carmelo Hayes. And we do need to talk about it. It started on the bump. And I can tell you, this is an everything counts scenario. Right. This is this is 
everything counts to a T. With 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 Bobby Lashley getting asked about a tweet and just going off on Carmelo Hayes and going off on the whole NXT generation, the people that are coming up, and Carmelo Hayes responding fire. Carmelo Hayes responding on Twitter. Carmelo Hayes responding on SmackDown. And it's like it happened on the bump. It bled out into Twitter. It gets referenced on SmackDown. Everything counts. And I would love it if this led into a a new generation NXT talent versus legends scenario. I think we can get there, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that on a future episode. I want to talk about where we're at with the King of the Ring. I want to, I I want to see if we got, uh, I'm going to check Twitter right now to see if my brackets are up to date on everything. Uh, yes. Okay. So in Macon, Georgia, Kofi Kingston defeated Rey Mysterio over the weekend. So, uh, yeah, now we've got uh, the second round of the tournament. On the Raw side, you got Gunther and Kofi Kingston, and which I'm not shocked by. You know, there's a personal vendetta there. And then you got Ilya Dragunov versus Jey Uso. On the SmackDown side, you've got Randy Orton versus Carmelo Hayes. You've got LA Knight versus Tama Tonga. So Gunther beat Sheamus, absolute classic on Raw. That was awesome. Kofi beat Ray at a live event. Ricochet, uh, Ilya Dragunov beat Ricochet on Raw. Jay Uso beat Finn Balor on Raw. Uh, AJ, Randy Orton beat AJ Styles. Awesome match to main event SmackDown. Carmelo Hayes beat Baron Corbin. Uh, that was a big thing. And, of course, Bobby Lashley injured, uh, so he wasn't able to compete. Uh, LA Knight beat Santos Escobar at a live event. Tama Tonga beat uh, Angelo uh, Dawkins. So... I really do, and I'm, you know, you'd you'd be surprised it's going to happen this quick. I feel like Gunther beats Kofi Kingston, and then I think Ilya Dragunov is going to beat Jey Uso, and uh, I think it's going to be with interference. I think that either Drew McIntyre or the Judgment Day is going to interfere. Uh, I feel like it leads to a Jey Uso versus Damian Priest rematch at the King and Queen of the Ring. But I think that frees us up to do Gunther versus Ilya in the Raw final. Could be Gunther versus Jay. That'd be great, too. But I think Gunther versus Ilya is your Raw final. And then, you know, I almost feel like Carmelo Hayes beats Randy Orton. Because again, going back to the Bobby Lashley thing, I think you can really build this Carmelo Hayes being the sort of top of the heap of egotistical new NXT guys. And Randy Orton is one of those prototypical legends. Um, I feel like you can go back and do a Randy Orton-Carmelo Hayes rivalry, which could be really, really great. Um, And then I think LA Knight defeats Tama Tonga. And I, I think that that happens through chicanery uh, and it will lead us to our next uh, bloodline fight at at crown at, at, at King and Queen of the Ring. So I think you've got Carmelo Hayes and LA Knight as your SmackDown final. I think Gunther beats Ilya this time. I think LA Knight beats Hayes. I think your King of the Ring final is Gunther versus LA Knight. I think Gunther beats LA Knight. That's where I stand right now. We can revisit uh, next week. And then in the Queen of the Ring tournament, you've got uh, Shayna Baszler versus Maxine Dupree. Maxine subbing in for uh, Zelina Vega. I thought that match had happened. I think Shayna won that match. Um, Let me just double check to see if that was confirmed, confirmed. But I do think maybe that hasn't been whatever. Um. Yeah, I maybe at 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 press time that match hasn't happened yet, but whatever. So the winner of that match versus Io Sky, and then Lyra Valkyria beat Dakota Kai on Raw. Zoe Stark beat Ivy Nile on Raw. I Io Sky beat Natalya on Raw. Uh, Nia Jax beat Naomi on SmackDown. Jade Cargill beat Piper on SmackDown. Tiffany Stratton beat Mi Chin at a live event. Bianca Belair beat Candice LeRae. So I really think on SmackDown, I think Jade Cargill beats Nia Jax. I, uh, you know, I think Tiffany Stratton might beat Bianca Belair. 
I was going to say that you might go to a baby face, baby face, and you still could. I think, I think Tiffany Stratton beats Bianca Belair. And I think Jade Cargill hands Tiffany Stratton her first loss. Well, maybe not her first loss. She will, I guess she's lost, but whatever. Like she's lost. I don't know if she's lost a singles match yet. Maybe she has, maybe I'm wrong, but a rare loss for Tiffany Stratton. I think Tiffany beats Bianca and then, and there could be chicanery. And then Jade Cargill beats Tiffany over on the raw side. I think you have EO sky and Lyra Valkyria. And then I think you're left with EO sky versus Jade. And I guess I think Jade might win. I'd love to see Tiffany Stratton be the queen of the ring but I think, I think it might be Jade. I think you might be looking at Jade Cargill and uh, Gunter as your king and queen of the ring this year. We're going to revisit those brackets next week when they're updated again. Uh, before we get there, let's say congratulations to Alicia Taylor. Alicia, the new ring announcer on SmackDown, her and Mike Rome doing the old Swapski. Mike Rome going back to NXT where he's going to kill it. And Alicia Taylor, if you haven't, I mean, she's just incredible. I love seeing her get opportunities, and uh, and I can't I can't wait to see more of her on SmackDown. The amount of of just big matches that she has introduced on NXT and made them just feel like such spectacles. When 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 Alicia introduces a championship match on NXT, oh, it's so good. We gotta, I mean. In terms of commentary, when you look at commentary and go, Raw's got McAfee and Cole. SmackDown's got Barrett and Graves. NXT's got Booker and Wade. Raw's got Samantha Irvin as the ring announcer. SmackDown's got Alicia and Mike Rome in NXT. You're looking at a really significant announced staff right now. Pretty great broadcast team in the WWE. And when I tell you, by the way, that the hosts of The Bump and Raw Talk specifically are also out of this world, I'm not bluffing. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on all of that. If you've got thoughts, uh, feel free to send them in. NotSamWrestling at gmail.com is our email address. NotSamWrestling at gmail.com. Uh, Jack from Michigan writes in, uh, Hey, Sam, I enjoyed this week's bonus episode with Peter Rosenberg. Uh, that was my 18th birthday when it dropped. Wow. I've been doing this since you were a little kid. Uh, so a nice little birthday present from my favorite podcast. Appreciate that, my man. And my last day of school was Friday. Wow. So thank you for that, and thanks for an awesome podcast. Well, Jack, congratulations on that. Uh, I hope you're going to Michigan State. Michigan State or Syracuse, one of those two. Uh, Anthony writes in, Hey, Sam, what's the haps? I hope your wife had a great Mother's Day. I appreciate that. My wife had a great Mother's Day. I made sure of it. I played her all the Uncle Howdy videos. And my mom had a great Mother's Day as well. I played her all the Uncle Howdy videos. Uh, I'm lucky enough to have my 11-year-old daughter, Mia, be an avid WWE fan like her dad since she was five. There's nothing better than your kid being a WWE fan. She's been addicted to all the Uncle Howdy QR codes. My kids are too... There's no way they're ready for that. They're... Way too scared for that stuff. They couldn't watch that scene in the Sandlot where it goes black and white and they're talking about the beast. So they're not ready for the ha Uncle Howdy codes. And wanted me to share with you her discovery. Okay, this is from an 11-year-old girl. And by the way, sometimes you listen to these kids, you're like, oh, the clarity that you have. I'm all convoluted because of my life experiences and trauma. You know, I can't look at things clearly. You, oh, through the eyes of babes. One of the URLs, had, oh my God, she's a genius. Had the letters WWE.com, R-R-M-B-H-P-A-W. She was ecstatic to tell me she figured out those letters are for Ramblin' Rabbit, Mercy the Buzzard, Huskus the Pig, and Abby the Witch. She also noticed the 404 QR code you spoke of did not say we believe when it glitched. It said we believed. Oh, we love the podcast and hope to meet you soon. Okay, first of all, even though I mentioned... That I, I figured that out from reading somebody's Twitter. I did not crack that code on my own, okay? So make sure your daughter knows that even though I said what I thought that code stood for, it's because I read somebody's tweet about it. So the fact that your daughter figured that out on her own, I am unbelievably impressed by her. Uh, 
and we believed. Mm. I love it even more. This kid of yours. I don't know if it's the parenting or she just got a big brain in that little head of hers, but you got a good one there, my friend. Uh, Floyd writes in, Ahoy, my podcast chief, or maybe it's chef. AEWWE Forbidden Door Supercard, let's talk about it. I mean, I think it's dumb to talk about it right now. We're gonna, Forbidden Door is, is coming up. So we're gonna be able to talk about it when Forbidden Door comes up, but I'll, I'll hear it out. You emailed him. Kickoff, Nikki Cross Valhalla versus Valhalla uh, versus Abaddon. Well, I guess it, it depends on what Nikki Cross is doing. The Acclaimed versus the Street Profits. I feel bad for both the Acclaimed and the Street Profits being on the kickoff show. And by the way, it's the countdown. It's the countdown to Forbidden Door. Uh, but this is a loaded show, so, uh, you know, just uh, Street Profits versus the Acclaimed would be the match, right? Uh, okay, the main card, Solo Sokoa versus Samoa Joe. Oh, wouldn't that be great if Solo Sokoa was like, I told you I was after a Joe who's Samoan, but it's a different Joe who's Samoan. It's Samoa Joe. <laughs> Joe Anawai, you know, Roman Reigns. Uh, Bobby Lashley versus Powerhouse Hobbs. That I mean, that's like a future versus legendary type thing. Willow Nightingale versus Nia Jax. I feel like you're just trying to kind of pairing up similar people. Nakamura versus Takeshita, Bailey versus Thunder Rosa. I don't know. These aren't, I feel like these are not, these are just similar people. You're not doing stories. Rey Mysterio and Dragon Lee versus Iho Del Vikingo and, and Commander. I get where you're going. Asuka versus Hikaru Shida. Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn versus Mark Briscoe and Eddie Kingston. Main event, the Young Bucks versus the Usos. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know, man. You're keeping. You're not, like, Swerve versus Cody Rhodes is not a thing. You're not putting either world champion on the show. You're not, I, it needs a lot of work, Floyd. It needs a lot of, I'll tell you right now, your card needs a lot of work. Cade writes in, what's the haps? I have a question for you about how you always say people do Mount Rushmore's wrong. My question for you is how do you do them correctly? All right, let me explain to you right now, okay? Mount Rushmore and I've said this before, and I'm only looking it up so I don't get it completely wrong, but uh, Mount Rushmore, uh, people do it as a top four. And it's not a top four, okay? The presidents on Mount Rushmore are George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Theodore Roosevelt, and Abraham Lincoln. Those four were chosen to represent the nation's birth, the nation's growth, the development of of the nation and the preservation of the nation respectively. Meaning George Washington is on Mount Rushmore to represent the birth of the United States of America and being the first president. Thomas Jefferson is on Mount Rushmore to represent the growth of the nation. Theodore Roosevelt, because of all everything Roosevelt did, the New Deal, everything, he's there to represent the development of the nation of the United States of America and Abraham Lincoln is there to represent the preservation of the United States of America, meaning everything that he did, obviously, uh, uh, with the Civil War and everything. So what I'm telling you is that the four people on Mount Rushmore, the real Mount Rushmore, are on Mount Rushmore for specific reasons, meaning if you were to do wrestling's Mount Rushmore, you would have to tell me who would you put on this mountain to represent the birth of, of professional wrestling or sports entertainment or however you want to do it, the growth of the industry, the development of the industry, and the preservation of the industry. We could do an entire show on it if you want me to do it. But if you come to me and you say, rank your top four things, and you say it's Mount Rushmore, I'm going to tell you to get that email off of my server because you're, you have no idea what you're talking about as far as Mount Rushmore's go. That's all. I think that's fair. I think that's okay. I hope that answers your question. Andy from London. I hope you and your family are doing well. They're doing great. I appreciate it. My question this week is around the WWE draft. I'm actually quite happy with how the draft turned out this year. Then you were probably happy with how it was before the draft. There's no point, okay, in moving lots of wrestlers around for the sake of it, uh, especially when a lot of them are involved in storylines. I'm not opposed to that uh, perspective, by the way. That's not wrong. To just move for the sake of something happening is wrong. To split up tag teams for the sake of we're splitting them up because it's the draft is wrong. So I'm not against that. 
If it's not broke, don't fix it. However, I do think how we get to those draft picks could do with an, could do with an amendment or two. My suggestion moving forward is there need to be there needs to be a new sports based path for the draft and allow GMs from SmackDown and Raw to ring each other in uh, midway through the draft process and trade picks. For example, next year, Adam Pierce could ring Nick Aldis and say, "We'd like to give you two third round picks for one of your second round picks," and then draft someone like Trick Williams. I think it would help make Trick or whoever gets the draft uh, a bigger deal and and even give them a storyline for when they enter the main roster. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that's a bad idea. I think also not every single person needs to be drafted. That, you know, when the NFL does a draft, not every single player is drafted. New players are drafted. So it's like, and I'm not just saying like call up, but like let's say each... Each brand has a certain number of draft picks. And beyond those draft picks, if you're not selected in the draft, you just stay on your brand. And maybe, maybe there are deals made going like, okay, I'll give you two round, I'll give you uh two third round picks, but you can't draft Seth Rollins. We get to keep this player and you get these extra picks. Stuff like that. I think that would be okay. Like they each get 15 picks or something like that, or they each get 12 picks. That way, if people you don't have to keep drafting people to the shows that they're already on. That might be something. Uh, Jeremy. Hi, Sam. Just wanted to say thanks for inadvertently turning Jim Cornette's opinion on Samantha Irvin around. You posted a clip from your interview with her in Tampa about Jim not liking her, and then all of a sudden a clip from his podcast appears on YouTube with him praising her. Nice to see Corny turn around on her. Keep up the great work. Yeah. By the way, I feel like Jim Cornette and his podcast, I love that Jim Cornette's podcast exists. I feel like my podcast and Jim Cornette's podcast, in terms of just analysis, not in terms of like the best historians, not in terms of like news and like scoops and stuff like that, but just in terms of breaking down the show, I feel like 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 we're temp poles. You know what I mean? We couldn't be doing more opposite shows. We probably couldn't feel more oppositely about certain things. But I feel like sometimes you wake up in the morning, you want to just have a nice, easy Sam Roberts time. Other times you wake up in the morning and you want to be entertained by Jim Cornette. I love the fact that our two shows exist. Um, I've only had great interactions in the past with Jim Cornette, by the way. Uh, I hosted a one-man show with him. Um, he's done. Not Sam Wrestling, back when it was Sam Roberts Wrestling Podcast. Uh, we haven't spoken in some time. But I, I, I believe that because of our mutual, genuine admiration. Here's the thing. We, Jim Cornette and I don't feel the same way about a lot of things, I'm sure. But we both love wrestling. And I love that. But I was very happy to see that. I was very happy to see that that clip went out there and uh, and then Jim Cornette uh, commented on it. I thought it was a great thing. Um, especially because he likes Samantha. Um, Mark uh, from California writes in, caught your latest podcast and had some uh, things to get your thoughts on. What is the contract status of uh, Hikaleo and Bad Luck Fala? I could see them joining the new Tongan line backing up solo. I brought up Bad Luck Fala last week, and uh, Hikaleo for sure fits right in there with them. I don't know their contract uh, 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 status. Like I said, that's a different podcast entirely. I don't, you know, that's not really the world that I'm in. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I, I love the idea of all the Tongans coming in. How much would Triple H let this storyline sprawl? Would he bring in uh, Zilla and Lance to join the Fatu and Hawaii bloodline? Who says Jacob has to come in with Solo? Couldn't he come in with his cousins, Zilla and Lance, as backup for Jimmy and Jay? I think the blueprint for this story is the Bullet Club OG versus the Bullet Club Elite. Look, I do think, uh, 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 but this leaves Triple H with a problem. The bloodline civil war is overshadowing Cody. What if Rock and Roman wrestle a tag team match against Tom? Look, there's a whole bunch of things, and I appreciate all your thoughts. I'm sorry if I'm rushing through it. It's just, you know... We want to get to it. I think what we don't want to do is NWO Hollywood versus NWO Wolfpack. You know, I think ultimately the bloodline becoming this major force on SmackDown and the only thing that can take it down is the OG bloodline is, is where you go. 
You know, I, I think that Jimmy and Jay Uso building another bloodline with the Samoans, it doesn't appeal to me right now. I'm not saying it wouldn't, but it doesn't appeal to me right now. I also wouldn't want to make the bloodline into like nine people on each team. Because now you're talking about, okay, you've got Solo. And also then what's Solo doing with all the Tongans? So you're saying you have five Tongans and Solo? I think the idea is not that the Tongans are an offshoot, but that the Tongans are a part of the bloodline. And that that's why putting a Jacob Fatu, if you were to bring in Zilla Fatu, who's the son of Umaga, uh, if you were to bring in Lance Anawaii, who's been wrestling on the indies for a very long time, really talented guy, I feel like they all, the bloodline isn't two things right now. It's still one thing. It's still one group that they threw Jimmy out of and Jay quit. Roman is apparently still talking to Solo. I think the idea of Roman and the Usos and Sammy versus whatever this new faction looks like is compelling. I think the idea of... The Usos and Roman and Zilla and 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 Jacob versus Solo and Tama and Tonga and whoever, you know, LA Smooth, Bad Luck Fala. Now it starts to get a little convoluted. And I think that that's a very thin line that they want to make sure that they walk properly. Uh, Tanner writes in, uh, hello, Lord of the Marks. I need to get that. Copyright. I need to get gimmick attorney on the phone. Big fan and first time emailer. Hopefully you and your wife had a happy Mother's Day. We. I hope she did too as well. Thank you very much. Uh, I believe she did. Love the segment between Cody and Logan on SmackDown. Logan absolutely crushed it on the mic as per usual. I'm not a huge fan of both belts being on the line, however. I would agree with you. Strictly the idea of Cody holding both belts doesn't do it for me. I would agree with you. I was holding out for a huge match at SummerSlam for Logan to lose the title since he's a Cleveland guy and that he's promoting it heavily. My only guess is that this match is that there will be a massive reveal or disqualification, possibly the Wyatt Six during the match. What are your thoughts? Okay, that gets interesting, Tanner. I love that you said that because I do think, okay, I do think that Cody stays away from the bloodline for now until The Rock comes back. Is the idea... That because, because the Wyatt Six or whatever this Nightbird thing is so anti what the WWE has done to them. And Cody is so the poster boy of WWE. And they were not the chosen ones and Cody was the chosen one. Is the idea that the Wyatt Six comes out. And you could argue Logan Paul is the chosen one too. Maybe the Wyatt Six comes out and just destroys both of them. And that's how we go off the air. You might be onto something there, Tanner. Maybe that's what we're getting. Maybe that's why both titles are on the line to build it up into this huge match that ends in a no contest because of the Wyatt Six interference. You might be onto something there, Tanner. I like, I smell what you're cooking and I like it very much. Oh boy. We got uh, Hari from India. I love how international this podcast is. Global, baby. Global. Recognize the power of Not Sam Wrestling. He writes, a serious problem, I feel, with Cody Rhodes' title reign, and it ain't his fault, is that he isn't going to have any credible opponents in his run, as we all know that the guy who beats the guy, and he beat Roman Reigns, also has to be very big. And just because of this, I cannot think of anyone from SmackDown who can convince the audience that he is capable of dethroning the guy who dethroned Roman Reigns. Look, I get it. You're not wrong. That's not, you're not wrong to have that concern. Here are two things that I would say. Number one, have faith. Don't I don't be pessimistic. You know, I don't believe in pessimism in life and I don't believe in pessimism in wrestling. It's not my it's not my bag, baby. Pessimism. It's not my bag, baby, by Sam Roberts. That's my book. Uh I would my only argument would be that this would be the silver lining to the fact that you had to deal with Roman Reigns having disqualification victories. Not just, disqual- I'm sorry, interference victories for two years. That every, aside from a handful, major victory that Roman Reigns had, there was interference, bloodline interference. And at the, in the moment, people got sick of it. But what did it do long term? It made it so, number one, 
The people who lost to Roman Reigns didn't lose any credibility. And if anything, they got better from it. And number two, it maybe alleviated the Cody Rhodes thing a little bit. Because while, yes, Cody Rhodes is the only guy that could figure out how to beat Roman Reigns, most of his potential opponents, the matches that they had with Roman Reigns were designed to look like they could have beaten him. So I don't quite think this is like somebody beating Hogan. It's a different thing. It's intricate. And I think it was done in a fairly genius way, but we'll see. You know, it's been a month, six weeks. Pedro writes in, we all want Roman, our tribal chief, back. My question for the podcast chief is, that's me. Why have uh, Tama Tonga and Tonga Loa, I have no idea how to spell their names. You, you spelled them both wrong. Not been in WWE. I don't have time to watch products outside of Raw and SmackDown. Have these guys been trying to get signed? Uh, you'd think somebody thought uh, you can't have too many dudes who look similar. I'm just uh, looking for some backstory. So I'll tell you, both Tama Tonga and Tonga Loa have been in New Japan, and they've been very successful in New Japan. Tama Tonga is a founding member of the Bullet Club and uh, was right there alongside uh, Carl Machine Gun Anderson and big OG uh, Gallows, uh, uh, big LG Gallows. OG, He's an OG, too. Um, and then Tonga Loa was a part of the Gorillas of Destiny, which also Tama Tonga was a part of, but these guys were doing really well in New Japan. And I can't tell you whether or not there were offers from WWE in, in the past several years, but the fact is that there are a lot of people who, while I'm sure they would love to go to WWE, have very fruitful careers outside of the WWE, be it in New Japan, AEW, wherever, and they go, you know what? I see that I could be successful over there, but for now it makes sense to stay, to do what I wanna do, it makes sense to stay. I don't know what kind of offers they got in the past. I can't speak on that. You'd have to talk to them and their uh, representation. But what I can say is they've had both, have had very successful careers in the industry outside of the WWE, which makes them even more impactful as they enter now. Uh, Dom from WrestlePub writes in, SmackDown's first segment between Cody and Logan Paul just ended and my initial reaction to its ending is compel me to reach out for your thoughts. I know we're just getting uh, going with Cody's championship reign, but this is the second time we've been given Cody's next opponent for the next premium live event. And it's ended with uh, him and Logan both standing tall in the ring with not a lot of tension that I felt between the two competitors. And I don't entirely hate this as it's uh, the archetypal white meat baby face who can do no wrong and hold his competitive integrity uh, in high regard. That also doesn't mean I don't want to see a heel do heel stuff to the baby face champion, even on their first interaction for a potential match. I can't stop thinking about how good Cody is as a heel, and I want his character to have a little more, I don't know, grit. I get it. I totally get it. And I think you'll get that grit when it needs to come out. Um, You've also got matches that are being made where the pay-per-view is coming right up. So I don't think in th the three weeks between Backlash and King and Queen of the Ring, you're going to build up enough story where Cody needs to get gritty. I think that you can you can do some stuff where Logan Paul is a real heel. Um, and I think that, you know, you did a little bit with AJ. But, I mean, this is part of having pay-per-views quick after WrestleMania. This is, you know, I, I would categorize this uh, in the uh, let them cook column, personally. Uh, Avik writes in, what's the haps from London? All over the place. We're very popular all over the globe. How do you feel about potential uh, potential female stars getting added to the bloodline? I think Tamina would be an obvious fit. Maybe, again, if it makes sense, then it makes sense. But I don't think that there's reasons to add people to the bloodline for the sake of adding people to the bloodline. Part of the bloodline is they piss people off and then people get their revenge on them. If you add women to the bloodline, are they going to do that to the female division? Are you going to add multiple women so they can do that to the women's division? You know, it's a, it's a different thing. Uh, I don't think it's a bad idea, but I think that it's one thing to say, well, you could add women to the bloodline because there are women to be added to the bloodline. Yes. Tell me what you would do. And then I'll talk about it. I'm not saying there's nothing to do with it. I'm saying, tell me what you're pitching. 
Um, Cobweb from the cast of the pod. It's a hottest horror movie podcast in the streets. Okay, all right, all right. We got big. The cast of the pod podcast. First thing, I love the show. This is my first email and won't be my last if it goes well. All right, let's see. It's a lot of pressure. Your perspective on what makes sense in the industry is what keeps me coming back to the industry that I love. That's sick. I wanted to bring back a topic that I thought was beautiful and is way overdue. Adding another title to the WWE's women division is a great idea. It elevates everything to another level. You could have it defended on Raw and SmackDown. I think the inaugural champion could be Naomi. After that, WrestleMania match with Bianca and Jade. Uh, this would be a great way to keep them together and form another faction. They have great chemistry. And with them having titles that can be defended on both shows, fits. Uh, and can you uh, find out uh, what the hand gesture they use when they are saying their names means. Stay fly, cobweb. Um, I'm not for the, I'm more pro mid-card women's championship, secondary women's championship than I ever have been before. Previously, I have not been. Now I can see the benefit of it for this uh, spot that we're in, especially with the amount of quality women's matches that we're getting. Timing's interesting. Are you going to do a tournament for that title right after you're doing a tournament for the Queen of the Ring? Maybe you can crown the Queen of the Ring with a championship that is co-branded. I don't know, but I'm not against it. And Naomi is not a bad pick. Uh, Dustin writes in, appreciate the insight as always. Where do you see Seth Rollins fitting in upon his return with CM Punk now feuding with Drew? Drew, do you see him coming for the World Heavyweight title or do you see him uh, something larger scale? Um... I think the World Heavyweight title is an option. I think CM Punk is an option. I think Cody Rhodes is an option. I think the Bloodline is an option. I think Roman Reigns is an option. Those are all options, and that's not even thinking creatively. I think Seth is going to be a god when he returns because, boy, did he leave WrestleMania shining brightly. Last one. I've kept you guys here for too long this week. Last one. Oh, nice quick one from John. Good afternoon, Sam. Do you think Solo and Roman will go one-on-one -on -one for the title of Tribal Chief? I think eventually we will get a Solo and Roman match. And yeah, I mean, I think it could be interesting if that's what it's for. I do love the idea of Roman coming back, him saying this isn't what I wanted, and Solo being, well, too bad. You lost, and now I'm the Tribal Chief and not giving up the spot when Roman returns. I think it could be interesting. Wrestling's always interesting. That's why we keep coming back. Hope you found today interesting. I had a great time with it. Don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Leave a comment. Leave a rating. Leave a, 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 a I mean, hit the subscription button. If you're listening on Apple, leave a rating, review, subscribe. If you're listening on Spotify, do the Q&A thing. Leave a rating, subscribe. Tell all your friends who watch wrestling. This is the wrestling podcast to go to. Appreciate all you guys. See you again in one week for Not Sam Wrestling 500.